International Women's Day recognises the achievements of women. It's also a call to action requesting that everybody stands up for women's rights and gender equality. Now, we're lucky enough to live in a world of opportunity. However, since COVID-19, those opportunities for women have regressed. Now, a recent study that I've been involved in with the e-learning network has uncovered a number of really interesting insights when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion. What stood out for me was a level of confusion from respondents around three areas in particular. One area was around diversity, equity and inclusion itself and how openly the learning industry drives these areas. A second area was around opportunities to progress within the industry. There's a small number of people that were getting over the glass ceiling, but then they were hitting a glass cliff. So there's clearly a lot more work to do. The third area was around how attractive we are to diverse and vibrant groups of talent as an industry. Now, when we look at the facts within these three areas, only a third of respondents could be confident that we were driving these areas. And that's not good enough. Now, this means we need to challenge and be courageous about how we challenge. So here's a call to be courageous when it comes to women's rights. Come and join us as we co-create the future in an evidence-informed way to make opportunities equal for all. Hello, ladies. How are we? Okay. Good. Good. Very good. 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 I've got some thumbs up. We're here um, and it's demonstrating that the majority of ELN board members are female. And we're here today to think a bit more about diversity and inclusion in the L&D industry ahead of International Women's Day on Monday. So um, we've recently been working with Jane Daly, as you know, um, to collate some research across the profession. So Jane has provided us with some uh, early insights and um, she's given us some uh, evidence against diversity and inclusion that she's captured in the study. And um, I'm just gonna bring it up here because I think it's really interesting that these three particular graphs that she's given us, um, one is how the e-learning industry openly drives diversity, inclusion uh, and ethical behavior. And you can see that most people neither agree nor disagree on this one. And if we flick through, we've got another one. Does the e-learning industry openly drive equal opportunities for all? And we have a third, uh, which the e-learning industry attracts emerging talent from a diverse, inclusive and vibrant range of employment routes. And something that's really interesting is that those three graphs, the majority of people have sat on the fence. They've taken the middle ground. They haven't actually answered the question. So. Do you think this is something where we don't want to talk about diversity and inclusion in our profession? Or does it mean that we shy away from it? What are your thoughts? Why don't you kick us off? Okay. Um, I wonder whether people are just reluctant to try and speak on behalf of the industry. So I'm aware that there's quite a lot of people who are kind of working on their own in a freelance capacity. They might have a bit of a mixed experience. And, and, I get, and that it's entirely linked to your own experience of, of working in the industry. Um, so again, that might depend on whether you're new or very experienced, because you might have different um, perceptions depending on where you are. So just mm -hmm. a, an initial couple of thoughts from me. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, do you want to add to that? You're, you've got a thumbs up. Yeah, so I think from my perspective, sort of working in the corporate world, a lot of companies have started to look at diversity and inclusion a lot more now. And I think the current climate has brought that to the forefront a lot more mm -hmm. than perhaps in the past. So I know it's always been sort of in the in the background for a lot of companies, but I think this current climate has sort of brought it up. So maybe that's why people are kind of sitting on the fence a little bit because they're not quite sure where it's going to go in their sort of current environment. Mm -hmm. 
I think the perception of DNI training is changing though and focusing a lot more on, on unconscious bias and being open and honest about it that everyone has it um, and how do we work against it so I think it is changing a lot and you know our audiences for creating learning are diverse and you know different so we need to have that diverse range of thought in the people building the training and learning as well I think it's important that we need to focus on it highlight it make inclusion a priority in all of the learning that we're creating um, if people aren't willing to shout about it how do we become that voice at the ELN to make inclusion um, more prevalent in the learning industry mm. I think also as well, we have to consider that the question is kind of twofold for the people that have been filling it out. Because when we think about industry that we're in, we always think about the company that we work in. Yeah. And, and if I think about the previous companies that I worked in, are they diverse and inclusive? And, and I'm thinking about that. And as a learning and development person, if I'm saying that we're not, I'm almost saying I'm failing at my own job. And, and that's quite hard to actually answer a question on. And then we're actually talking about the industry as in the e-learning industry, the L&D industry. And, and for many people, especially if they're freelance or they work on their own or on a small team in an organization mm -hmm. and they don't get to have a big network or they don't get to go to lots of conferences and see our industry as in our professional industry, how do they know that we are diverse and, inclu and inclusive? So it, I think the reason that they're sitting on the fence is because they actually don't know how to answer the question. Okay, so that's, that's really interesting because in the, the Rethink Cafe that um, you were involved in, mm. Han, and, and you, Ashley, um, you know, you discussed what, su what successful implementation of DNI would look like in the industry. And we've got some stats on that because um, these are some of the answers that came through based on that question. So success at like no more struggle we just get on and do it we stop talking about it that we welcome everyone we're more innovative we remain in the profession you know this pull culture you know considering we're coming up to international women's day 2021 what would women's equality in the learning industry look like to you I'm proud to work for a female-led organization uh, the management team and in my learning team we have mainly women, it's brilliant. I think it's about creating a sense of belonging and acceptance um, and encouraging everyone, um, you know, doesn't matter about where they come from, who they are, it's about inclusion, their identity, recognizing the quieter voices in the team as well. Um, yeah. Something we do is a shine theory. So shine on upon people to call out those people who aren't the loudest. And sometimes that can be women in the team, um, but just to recognize their achievements. Uh, so shine theory came about um, a couple of years ago and it's, it's helped people understand that there's not only one position at the top. If everyone succeeds, then, you know, there's, there's room for everyone to succeed in the company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I was just going to mention a couple of the companies that I've previously worked for, and it was generally men heading up the L&D department, and then, and then the ladies were the trainers, um, with a few gentlemen speckled about, but it was generally the heads of the training and the managers of the training were, were men. Um, I've worked for a couple of places where that's been different, where the ladies have been in the higher up positions but the majority have been it's men leading the L&D side of things so I think it would be great if we could get more women in the higher positions of L&D departments within organizations because a company may be completely diverse as a whole but within that L&D function are they diverse yeah anyone else relate to, to Kim's examples? Yeah. I can. Go on, Joan, do you want to go first? Now, just quickly, I mean, I started life as a teacher, and I think in the education sector, you have a strong body of women in the teaching roles because it's a nurturing, caring profession. But as you move up the hierarchy, it becomes more male-dominated, even though mm. there are far more female teachers, I think. I don't think it's the same in at university level, Hannah, but that was my experience in secondary schools mm. uh, and primary, I think schools are even worse. So I don't think yeah. it's unique to the corporate L&D world. 
mm-hmm. or, or even the freelance world. Gemma, mm-hmm. what, what, what was your thought? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, looking at it from a school perspective, I can see where you're coming from because I've obviously got three children and all in primary school and the majority of teachers are female. Mm-hmm. I think there's one one male teacher that's that's my son's teacher um, and then one male teacher assistant in the preschool where my youngest goes to. So it, it does sort of flip between that sort of um, predominantly female arena. But likewise to Kim, like some of the companies I've worked for have been predominantly male. And, and as you go down, it, it's females that sit in those training positions. And when we first moved into the digital arena at, at my last company, um, there was more males that sort of got asked to pick up the digital content. It was only because me and a colleague put our hands up and said, we'd like to have a go at that. We'd like to be involved in the digital design world. Can, can we have a go, please? Mm-hmm. That we, we obviously got our voices heard. Um, but where I work currently, it, it's it's like you, Hannah, it's it's quite sort of female led at the top, which is which is refreshing because you know it's that different perspective of things and I think it's quite refreshing as well looking at us now on this screen as a board that you know there are quite a few females now that are sort of in the board positions so you know we've we've got a prime position to sort of get that message across haven't we to to the rest of the L&D world. So whilst I agree that you, you can encourage inclusivity and diversity as a whole like you were saying the top positions, as Kate Graham's research has demonstrated, has is predominantly male. And then if you read Invisible Women, it's predominantly male. And in academia, Joan, it's exactly the same as in education. There are not enough female professors. There are not enough female doctors because most of the time women are juggling so much and then they're having to write and publish and, and research for a thesis and get a chair position to get a professorship. And it's, it's almost impossible. Um, and I think that is a, is a massive problem because one of the conversations I had last year is how do women now, taking into account Hannah's shine, um, how do women now push themselves forward to go for promotions if we're all at home? We're no longer visible. So how do we do mm. that? You know, and, and, and Hannah's in a very lucky position to have such an amazing company to work for with such an amazing system. Mm. But not every company does. So how do we encourage our, our members, people in our community to move forward if, they, if they're physically not seen? That's we, really hard. Uh, we've put together some rituals. That we do a Gratitude Wednesday where we shine and say thank you to people. So there's certain things that companies can put in place to recognize and, and hear the quieter voices. And I think it's about teaming up and shining upon people. So women supporting women, I think is such a, a brilliant thing to do and to shout out and recognize that people have got lots more going on um, in their personal lives and just met, making each other heard. You know, it could seem counterintuitive and a bit intense, but actually, like I said, this success isn't finite. If one person won't only get that that success, that the success can be shared amongst everyone. So I think it's really important that we share our successes, but also get men involved and um, get the men involved on this call and how can they support women and see all the other things that we're doing. So. Um, yeah, it, it's those celebratory events and ri- rituals that uh, companies can in- introduce, you know, just a half an hour on a Wednesday, we, we do this every week. Um, it's gratitude and it just really shines on those people who you wouldn't normally think of. So there's simple stuff like that that I think um, companies can do. I think that's a brilliant idea because you're actually walking the talk. I think what, what's been interesting for me is, is the work that Andrew Jacobs has done with these Women Talking About Learning podcast series. Um, now, he walks the talk in the sense that, you know, he will not uh, accept uh, an invitation to speak at a conference until he's seen the makeup of the panel. And it isn't just gender, you know, it, it's all sorts of um, inclusion. I, I see he's even posted something about um, Clubhouse not being inclusive enough, for example, uh, I think is that what it's called I've not been in there yet so um, but yeah so and his podcast that he did on imposter syndrome really brought to light a huge number of very I mean mostly successful women who under the surface 
just had been or were or still are lacking in self-confidence mm. so you have to ask yourself what is it that makes them feel that way what, what, you know where does that come from how do you stop it how do you build up the confidence what I do think is women we suffer with imposter syndrome or why do you think it's more apparent that women are talking about imposter syndrome more than men Gemma I can wholeheartedly put my hand up and say that I hugely have imposter syndrome and I think the problem for me is that in my head I try to be everything to everyone so I've you know I've got three children so I try to be everything there thinking that you know I've got to achieve everything and my kids have got to be well-rounded and be able to do everything that they need to be able to do at a certain age because that's what society tells you is supposed to happen Um, you've got to step back from sort of thinking what the, the ideal is and just you know step back from that but it is that everything to everyone you want to be the perfect mom the perfect wife you want to be successful in your career you want to have friends that you can go out with but you I think the problem for me is it's taking that step back and realizing that you can't be everything to everybody you've just got to be the best version of yourself to the you know to the important parts of your life and, and I think that's that's my issue I just try to do too much at once for me because I was in that recording along with Jane um on imposter syndrome it was for me I reframed it and stopped beating myself up and said okay what would a man do like if I was brought up as a man what would a man do and this is I think like what does a man do quite often actually um and and I I decided that imposter syndrome is just a comfort zone check that's all it is and I went, okay, it's a comfort zone check. And, and I just reframed it as it's no longer a problem. It's just me checking that I'm moving out of my comfort zone. And you don't, you don't have imposter syndrome making a cup of tea. I doubt anyone has imposter syndrome when they're making their dinner or, or brushing their hair because we do it a thousand <laughs> times a day. So why would I have imposter syndrome here? It only becomes my comfort zone if I go into it. And I yeah. think that's what we need because all the time you get like that and and I had an appraisal with a very lovely feminist male boss very very lovely man and um and it was a couple of years ago and he said to me um I only have one comment to make about you in your appraisal that you need to consider and I was like oh my god like what have I done you know automatically woman oh my god I've (laughs) like ended the world and and he said you always say yes to everything and I went okay and he said, uh, so, so I give you an impossible challenge and go, yep, yeah, okay, boss, I'll go do that. And off I go. And he goes, it makes me nervous. And I said, well, what would make you more nervous? Me saying yes and going off and working out how the hell I was going to do it. Because I don't always know automatically. Or do I go, oh, I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. Which one makes you more confident in me? And if I was a man and I said yes, would you be more confident in me? I think there was a a good point raised there earlier about as women, is it just that we're more open to discussing imposter syndrome? Mm. Because I know a lot of men that I've worked with before, they don't talk about the feelings. They don't talk about their challenges. They just do it and then, and then struggle behind the scenes. So I think it is that we're a lot more open in talking about it because we we all have imposter syndrome, whether we're going to admit it or not. And it's just about what kind of front you're putting on. So for instance, I'd put on a very confident front pretty much all the time. Um, It's very rare that I would let that slip and let people see that behind the scenes, I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing, (laughs) but I'm going to wing it until it works. So I think it is that, women are in general a lot more open to talk about things but showing them is another matter as well Mm. I think I'll agree with that because I was um, on a webinar a few weeks ago um, by a lady who wrote a book on imposter syndrome ditching the imposter syndrome is called I think and um, she's talked about the um, the most recent research that they uh, done on 2020 asking men and women uh, on how often do you feel 
uh, imposter syndrome, right? You know, do you feel it every day? And she's revealed the number of uh, females who said that, which was 52% of women said, yes, they do every day uh, of their life. They feel like an imposter. Uh, so they suffer from it. Um, and everybody thought men probably, you know, like 10, 20. It was 49%. So it's just 3% different, but you mm. are right. They are probably mm. better at covering it shall I say or you know they, we, as women yes we like to talk about um, feelings and how we fare in the world and you know the internal turmoil then men they they are thought better perhaps to you know cover it and deal with it in other ways. I think it's really interesting Andrew Jacobs podcast when I listened to it I felt um, quite comforted that I wasn't the only woman that has imposter syndrome or wasn't you know, there are other other women out there who aren't afraid to put their hand up and say, yes, I, I struggle. Um, and it makes me think how many how many men would put their hand up and contribute to a podcast if Andrew put a call out to men to do it. Because mm. I know Han and, and Jane, you were one of what, 20 odd women, I think, that yeah. contributed to the yeah. podcast. I was in it too. Yeah. And Jane, yeah. Mm. So, um, Jane, were you not in how it? Many would get. Yeah, and I had to really push myself because I really didn't want to do it and didn't feel that I deserved or had anything to say. But um, I was surrounded irony. by friends and, yeah, encouraged by... And I think my message was, um, in relation to your what you mentioned earlier on, Joan, how do we get, get over it? And it is just surrounding myself with people that are so supportive and encouraging. And I must say my network has been hugely supportive and I am in a better place dealing with it or just as you say being accepting of it uh, mm. than I was a year ago I think it gets easier as you get older <laughs> well, do you, yeah, are you yeah. not bothered as much like is it that there comes a point isn't there that you just go <laughs> oh never mind you get kind of it's, it's part of your comfort zone thing it's it's being happy in your own skin mm. but it's also knowing you know coming to realize your own worth and accepting that you have your own intrinsic values and worth and you are different to everybody else because we're all individual but it's it's how much you're influenced by what other people think or what you think they might think i think it's what? recognizing that we're role models mm. when i was um promoted onto the senior leadership team a couple of years ago and it was very uh, exciting that i was a female on this on the smt and you know going to these board meetings and manage leading a growing division of the company uh, I didn't want to be recognized as being a female leader I just wanted to be a leader yeah. it really bothered me that people were celebrating the fact that I was a woman and doing it and on on the SMT yeah. but then one of the junior members of the, the team came up to me and said it was actually incredible and she really looked up to me and that I was a role model for her so I had to kind of embrace the fact that I was a, a female leader doing this type of thing and accept that the fact that I was a woman doing it not just a leader but mm. for a while it did bother me that people mm. isolated me as, as being a woman uh, in a in a senior position um, I should just be anyone in a senior position but I, I have come to accept that in the last few years that and be proud and celebrate the fact that um, I'm in the position I am. No I think it is important to acknowledge that if, if you're in a position of power um, and you embody certain characteristics i.e being a woman um that it, it is something to be used for the greater good i think it only becomes problematic if it's a tokenism mm. right you're being put into that po position because of oh yeah we need one of those yeah, yeah. whatever the, one of those protected mm. characteristics are right um and then you're you're just there to represent that whatever you're talking for and that's when it becomes I think problematic but otherwise yes if you're in a position of power you definitely need to go with the whatever the characteristics that you possess naturally right mm. uh, to use that for the greater good definitely you, you're right we, we need to be role models but we need to also be thinking about are we challenging enough um, the some of the tokenism um, you, you say yeah. I, mean, I hear what you say um, Ashley but it might be quite interesting to think about what's been going on in the media for the last 10, 15 years. I mean, I was in the BBC for 18 years. The culture in the BBC, and this is why diversity training didn't work, was that people wanted to work with the people they knew and loved. Hmm. 
So if, if I formed a great relationship with one of you on one program, I would come straight back to you for the next program that I yeah. had to do. And to break that was very difficult. So what they ended up doing was introducing sort of quotas for, for example, independent production. So they said, right, I forget what the percentage, say 10, 15% of all new commissions must be made by independent production companies. So they ring fenced mm -hmm. a whole bit of the budget to encourage those people to come through. And I, I think the idea is that once they were through and doing great stuff, it, it would pick up and move forward from there. Mm -hmm. And I think the same is true of things like disability um, opportunities for say training journalists or, you know, so having certain programs to develop them. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they've got a women in leadership one, but you know, that kind of thing, um, because you have to sort of make some progress somehow. So what are your thoughts on doing something like that? In I mean, I am not disputing the need for positive action because we're not there yet. Definitely. We need to do the positive action, but sometimes what tends to happen that you bring those diverse people in and you say, here is the circle. And here is your circle. You stay out there. Or we bring them in our circle, but we still ring fence them and they stay. So that mm -hmm. how does it become part of the bigger circle? And how do you enable that belonging, which th that's all it comes down to, because yeah. it's almost like three stages. You got the diversity first sorted, inclusion, so make those three people feel included, and then actually that they belong there. And mm -hmm. a lot of the initiatives and perhaps a lot of the diversity training it fails because it doesn't go through the all the three phases it just does yeah we hired them okay great it's like a tick box exercise isn't it it's mm. almost like we've ticked that diverse box now we've got that person in job's done and it's moving outside of that job's done piece isn't it to get that belonging piece that it is just the norm and it's not anything outside of that I, I a little while ago I saw a tweet from his professor and, and he it was very well liked and trending on Twitter and he said I rejected a place on a panel because there weren't any women on it so I said no and therefore I'm a woke feminist kind of thing and I was like um actually like that's great saying no however all they're going to do is find another guy that says yes <laughs> and what you have to say is I'll come if I can bring someone else and that someone else is a woman and leverage your power to help a woman get through the door. Going no is not good enough because they're not going to go, you're right, I should go out and find some women. Ah, do I actually know any in our field? And, and instead they're going, no, we'll just find another bloke that will say yes. <laughs> so I think that the, the circles that you're talking about actually is really important that, that the men inside the circles know how to leverage. And Andrew is uh, Andrew Jacobs is a prime example of that because uh, last year a, a company contacted me about a speaking gig and they said, Andrew has said that we should talk to you and Andrew's coming on board if you come on board. And I was like, okay, I'll come on board. That's fine. You know, that that is good use of positive diversity yeah. and and I can't like sort of express enough that we can smash that door as hard as we want or if it's us we're politely knocking um <laughs> but we kind of need sometimes people to go allow me to open that door that's not saying that we're not good at what it is that we do we are damn good at what it is that we do not visible it's just we're too damn polite that we're saying it at a low tone level. Mm. We're not shouting about it and we need somebody else to speak their language for us to go her over there. She's rather good. And I think that's that's crucial. And, and so I think International Women's Day also has to be about how men can also be allies to women. How do you um, think the ELN can play a role in helping women get to the table? I it, It's an interesting one because um, last week in the um, last session of the learning technologies digital experience um, Kate Graham women in learning uh, there was a session uh, following on from the previous one and um, power of networks came through quite um, powerfully we do have a great opportunity to help people who are entering new into the field because um, I remember 
quite a few years ago, but still, um, when I was looking uh, for, okay, where do I go to learn more about e-learning, uh, e-learning network was one of the first things that came up. And uh, actually it was one of the very first industry events that I attended, which is the Connect, where I kind of went, oh, they are lovely. Um, <laughs> and that actually opened so many different connections for myself. So, uh, and, you know, fast forward quite a few years and here we are. I think you're, you're right in the sense that we have that role that we can play and we are walking the talk you know we're we've got women on the board we've got a diverse mixture um maybe we can do even more going forward you know who knows but it is role modeling and it is being inclusive i think um jane the mentoring program is a, a big benefit for those um as part of the eln just wondering if it'd be interesting to see if we have more male mentors and more female mentees or the other way around mm. depending on who feels they need more support and at what time is there yeah career. no that's that's a great point I don't think there is to be honest um, mm. which I'm pleased uh, to say I think it's quite equal but I will obviously go back and and um and have a look and let you know what um, what I've observed about the mentoring is that people I've mentored have gone on to be mentors themselves mm -hmm. and I think I think building the skills for people to be able to do that um is, is powerful mm. and it's also a very reflective process obviously because it makes you reflect on your own thoughts and assumptions and everything but um that's not really diversity but it maybe it's inclusion <laughs> just give, having more people feel that they can take on those extra roles and give something back i think is good and i think we're we are known to be a friendly and supportive network so mm. you know we don't have we're not driven by the the, the finances and the the commercial aspect so we do have a lot of freedom in that sense but mm. what else do you think we could be doing though i think the slack channel is is excellent because i am a member of other organizations and over the years both academic and corporate and we never had anything like that so it was you always broadcast to here's some mm -hmm. things here's some things yeah. whereas whenever we're in a a meeting or a webinar like for example the the one that I was um chairing with Kim for Gemma um and we mentioned the slack channel the first thing is people are like oh oh join the slack channel because they they want to mm. be so far into our network and and there's so many women on that slack channel which is really great because they feel like they can talk mm -hmm. and and we had one today that has just joined not only just joined ELN but has just joined our industry and she's only been in it six months, I think it was, Jen. And, and we all piled on and said hi. And I just thought, you know what? When I started out it, back in the dark ages, like there was, there was nothing. There wasn't, there just wasn't anything for me. You just went into it You're on your own. all yeah. by yourself. Yeah, and fought your mm -hmm. own ground. So um, maybe we should open up a women in learning thread on the Slack so, so we can mm -hmm. have a place there. Um, and that obviously men can look in and, and join in conversations because I do genuinely believe that educating men and, and how to be allies, especially in the Me Too movement where people are being a little bit jumpy and they don't need to be, um, I think that's really important. Oh, but there is also a symbol for International Women's Day. So we should probably take a photo of us all. So if anyone can do a screenshot. Yes. Future. So, yes. give, us a, give us a countdown first before you do what it. What are we doing? <laughs> is it a particular yeah. hand or is it any hand? Oh, God, I don't know. I've that. only ever seen photos using this hand. Yeah. No, the other one. Is that your on. left or your right? <laughs> there you go. Which is, 